Okay, so this is an eight-year-old male that we did this, this case is probably one or two months ago, two months ago actually. Uh, uh, prior surgery, uh, he had a um, stentless bioprosthetic freestyle valve, 20, 29 millimeters. It was 16 years prior to this uh, current presentation, and then he showed up in our AED with a one week of worsening dyspnea and lightheadedness. He had an echo one, one year prior to this admission, showing a normal ejection fraction with a uh, trivial uh, bioprosthetic aortic valve insufficiency. <clears throat> and now, currently, progressively short, uh, more short of breath, uh, with abdominal <laughs> discomfort, uh, you know, two sat saturation uh, below 90%, even he was in three liters of nasal cannula, and blood pressure was very soft, as you can see there. <clears throat> that was the EKG, really not really remarkable. This is the transthoracic echo that was done when the patient was admitted. And this patient, interestingly, he was not uh, initially admitted to our structural heart service, so he was, he was admitted to a, one of our uh, surgeons at the hospital. And we were not consulted in the very beginning of this admission. They read the echo as moderate AI, but clinically, this patient had clearly severe aortic regurgitation going on. Kath, a remarkable. And as you can see, the orthogram, you're going to see severe aortic insufficiency going on there. So, this patient was capped uh, by the surgeon in the um, CICU, and he had planned for a redo sternotomy, a redo AVR. Uh, remember, he's 80 years old. So he was kept in medical management uh, in the CICU. Then 48 hours later, he was kept in dopamine. 48 hours later, we were uh, consulted because the patient was just not doing well, and he had not been taken to the OR. And obviously, at that moment, so we have to take this patient now uh, and do a valve involved on him. <clears throat> These are the measurements of the CTA. So you can see a perimeter of 93, um, wide sinus, um, low coronaries, but very wide sinus. No other remarkable things. The access is very good. So we, we do all of our cases in local anesthesia with, low, with um, just mild sedation. This patient specifically, he, he could not even lay flat, so we ended up taking him uh, to the hybrid OR and uh, general anesthesia with TE guidance. This is the TE uh, interprocedure. That was the procedure. It was a very uneventful uh, procedure. I implanted a Evolut R34, um, no recapture. It was a very, very smooth intervention. <clears throat> Great result. At this point, everybody was uh, high five there. Um, so the um, diastolic blood pressure improved. LVDP came down, so we were very happy. Blood pressure, he was hemodynamically stable. Then I left that day. I went to, a, there was an outreach dinner with some of our referring physicians. I was starting to have a glass of wine, and I was paged. It was around 8.30. Um, that the patient was not doing well in the CTICU. Uh, hypotensive, MAPS in the 40s, they started drips, epi, norepi, and the bedside echo showed a left ventricular ejection fraction of 15%. If you remember, the initial one was around 45-ish. Uh, apparently, no cardiac tamponade in the bedside echo. I obviously went back to the hospital and thought, well, I have something happened in this case. I'm not, I was not quite sure what was going on. Uh, tamponade, apparently no tamponade. Coronary occlusion, obviously, is a, is a concern here. Eventually, a PE, or just the inflammatory response of the you know, cardiogenic shock. This patient waited too long to be treated. So, and if that's the fourth option, it's we blew it because they kept this patient too long uh, until he was uh, finally treated. Took him back to the, OR, to the cath lab, took the root shot, there was no coronary occlusion, and honestly, my suspicions for coronary occlusion was very low here with this wide sinus. It's extremely highly unlikely that he would occlude his coronaries, and in fact, there's no occlusion to the coronaries there. At this point, you see the swan, the swan catheter there. I put a, a, a transtremoral uh, impella CP. Still, I was not happy uh, with the numbers. He, this, this patient is a little, relatively big guy. Um, so I decided to um, upsize the impella for a 5-0 impella. So we, we, did the, we did so. The numbers improved a little bit when we, we uh, upsized to the 5-0. The wedge came down. 
and his blood pressure was stable, uh, and his PEPI was 1.3, uh, so he was not in severe RV failure, although he had some baseline uh, RV dysfunction to start. So we, we treated his uh, RV dysfunction with murinone and epiprostanol. He, kept, he was kept with the Impella uh, 5.0 and was progressively weaned from epinephrine. So at that point, there was no coronary occlusion, no tamponade, uh, and the hypothesis is just that we sat for too long in this patient, and when he was taken to uh, the um, uh, OR, he was uh, probably too late. And as you can see here, the renal function panel, CBC, uh, and uh, the lactate of this patient, this is a very, uh, these are very interesting to, to pay attention to because after we gave him the hemodynamic support that he just needed at that point, the, all of his uh, labs progressively improved, and this is what happened with him, right? So he was, uh, they waited too long, uh, 48 hours sitting on that patient with severe acute AI, and we almost uh, reached to the point that the spiral of shock would be not reversible, but thankfully we were able to give him enough hemodynamic support to reverse that. Um, the Impella 5 was removed uh, in the day six post-intervention, uh, and he was sent home uh, on day 13 uh, post-intervention. These are the echoes that we have there. So the pre transthoracic echo, the, the first day post-procedure, as you can see, biventricular failure there at PO uh, D5, much imp uh, significant improvement there. And then this is the follow-up echo. Uh, this patient is doing really well now. Uh, and I just saw him like a couple of weeks ago in clinic and he's doing really, really great. Just to take some uh, take home messages here, we have to know the differential diagnosis for uh, cardiogenic shock post TAVR. Timely intervention is extremely important. And we always say that uh, emergent or urgent TAVR is not a very good thing to do, but in these patients with severe acute AI, definitely we should. Uh, make a decision very fast and not to wait too long because if they go in the spiral of shock, that's going to be probably irreversible, which almost happened with this patient. Um, thank you very much, Dash. We, we heard a lot of um, nice talks from Joao and others for imaging, and of course you don't have time in this case, but it would be interesting to see an MRI, right, in this yeah, time. but yeah, definitely. But we just didn't have time. It was yeah, it was extremely. No chance for doing it afterwards, just to see if there's any kind of substrate in his ventricle. Yeah, we, we ended up not doing because because he recovered. The clinical course was so we ended up just not doing anything. If if the clinical course had not been this recovery, that really impressive recovery that he had, of course, I, I think uh, we we should have done something. But we ended up not doing. It. Mario, the, um, just for the panel and maybe even for the audience, one of the things is. Uh, a great recognition, great save, especially in the escalation to 5.0, because you really yeah. are, and your picture is beautiful about the spiral. Um, more and more, uh, especially as a heart team approach, cardiologist and surgeon, we have a lower threshold for ECMO, and moving to that sooner than later, uh, whether it's right or wrong, and just everybody else's perspective, but yeah. uh, we, we now have almost that service where we're just skipping a step at times. We we ended we end, no we ended up uh, scanning uh, Paul at some point um, uh, when he was in the CTSU there was a concern but that was like I, I don't remember specifically what day that was but yeah there were there was we scanned his head there was no no issues going on yeah nothing 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 EKG was okay. Uh, I, I indeed I, I took him to the lab right immediately to, to I took that shot the angiogram there was a, but no EKG changes nothing yep. But Mike will. He gave me a good a good bottle of wine actually. <laughs> Thank you very much.